in Korean, uh, we say hi, in 안녕하세요, so please use it in Korea when you visit someone, yeah. Uh, really, I really appreciate to joining this session because I have never expected such a huge audiences because it's a last session of Cl uh, the Google Cloud Next. I really appreciate. Uh, in this uh, session, uh, there are three speakers. Uh, I'm Jason, customer engineer at Google Cloud. I look after Netmarble. And uh, Asuji Sensei, we usually call him Sensei, the great teacher. Uh, he's a solutions architect at Google Cloud uh, who has strong expertise in AI and machine learning. And Jennifer uh, is uh, the, the team member of Netmarble, who is a very talented the ML engineer. So here are contents. Uh, in this session, we're going to talk about the, the case studies of Netmarble in terms of anomaly detection in MMORPG. So in the beginning, I'm going to talk about the brief introduction about Netmarble and uh, what is their business and why they chose machine learning to detect users. So after that, SG will be presenting about uh, the challenges, what they have faced uh, to leverage machine learning models in order to detect anomaly detections. And he's going to present about the solutions what Netmarble is currently using. And after that, Jennifer is talking about the collaboration between Google Cloud and Netmarble in order to accelerate their process and also enhance the model. And after that, uh, Jennifer and I will be talking about the next steps about the deploying multiple ML pipelines and also enhancing the, and the, the empowering the detecting powers. And there is a Dory, uh, the Dory in a, the cloud app, so you can have questions very freely uh, by using the Dory Q&A. So in order to use Dory Q&A, uh, please open your, the Cloud Next app and uh, tap our session, and you can submit your questions to the Dory. Then we're going to handle the questions, but unfortunately, we have limited time, so we are not going to handle uh, during the session. But I promise that uh, I'm going to handle every question, so feel free to submit your questions. So yeah, I'm going to talk about the brief introduction of Netmarble and their business. And I'm going to uh, give you the reason why Netmarble chose machine learning to detect uh, those kind of ab uh, the abnormal users. Uh, this is a, a brand logo and the, the brand symbol of Netmarble. The brand symbol is a yellow dinosaur. Yeah, it looks like alligator, but yeah, dinosaur. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the dinosaur named Kuku. Kuku means that uh, just laughing in Korean. So when we usually have fun, then ju we just say, K -k 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 -k, yeah, something like this. <laughs> yeah. So we yeah we usually uh, have fun, then we just say. In a text message, so uh, the the name is very related with the Netmarble's missions. So Netmarble's mission is that uh, the entertaining the world with the fun games. So Netmarble usually try to deploy and release the fun gaming tile to ent the entertain the real world. And here's some uh, numbers presenting Netmarble. Yeah, as you can see, Netmarble is the third the game publishers in global, and also they already acquired 68 million multi the monthly active users, and this number is larger than whole Korea population. So we can see uh, Netmarble is focusing not only Korea but also global business. And uh, in order to entertain the world, Netmarble already has 19 subsidiaries as a development studios and 5,000 plus uh, the employees as a game developers. The here are key products of Netmarble. So the lab two things are Blade and Soul Revolution, Lineage to Revolution, which are MMORPG, mobile MMORPG. Uh, so those two products are really popular in Asia, and the the generating the more than 100 million dollars, uh, and also the right two things are very popular in Korea, named uh, the Seven Nights, and also uh, the you know Marble, yeah. 
this is marble game. <laughs> so the marble future fight hit the world and they just acquired the millions of uh, users in the world. So as you can see, the, the key products of Netmarbles are high fidelity games, which is uh, easily to acquire uh, loyal users and also heavy spenders. So servicing a uh, high fidelity game, uh, it's very important to uh, create the big revenues. And there are uh, key success factors uh, are two things. The first thing is that acquiring the heavy spenders who is willing to spend more than $100,000 for game. Yeah, it's crazy, but true. Yeah, yeah, really true, yes. And the second thing is that the retaining that kind of heavy spenders in a long time, in a long lifetime. So in order to do this, Netmarble usually leverages the, the most famous IPs, such as Marble Future Fight, yeah, it used the uh, Marble IP, and Lineage 2 and Blade & Soul is developed by NCSoft, but it's really popular in Asia. So Netmarble leverages these IPs to uh, acquire most of heavy spenders. And in order to retain uh, those kind of heavy spenders, uh, Netmarble should manage the ecosystem of the MMORPG game because if the habit spender feels that someone is stronger than me without spending any money, then they just, yeah, oh, this is uh, just an unfair game. And they just leave the game. Yeah, they just leave the game. And they just try to find another MMORPG. So managing the ecosystem is the most key part yeah, of the success of the, the high fidelity game. So Netmarble usually uh, the try to manage the ecosystem, but as you know, so many people are coming, then someone, yeah, someone will be a bad guy. So uh, in this case, we call them abusers. So there are some of the abusing cases in MMORPG. The first case is that they try to abuse the, the bug of the, the, some of the marketing events or content updates. So for example, uh, the Terra M yeah, has uh, some bugs in our, the in-app in promotion. So some abusers, they cheated to get some multiple reward by clicking multiple times. Uh, due to that issues, it made high inflation of the gaming economy. So the most of heavy spender churned yeah, very yeah, immediately. And the second thing is that uh, some of the abusers, they just ha try to hack the client vulnerabilities, such as the memory hacking or just some of the, yeah, trying to re uh, send some multiple messages to get reward, multiple rewards. Yeah, and also the last thing is that some uh, genius hackers, they uh, usually use this leverages bots to generate in-game resources yeah, automatically. So some uh, the abusers, they just running 10, yeah, 10,000 bots to generating in-game resources, and they just try to sell it to the market. Yeah, so Netmarble tried to block those kind of users by using rule-based model, yeah, because it's really uh, accurate and it's uh, very easy to understand. So uh, then when uh, Netmarble uh, planned to uh, the release the game, uh, they just designed the business model. At this time, a uh, business development team also designed the rule, rules to detect some abusers. For example, uh, the, if the someone uh, reached out to the 100 level in, in a week, then that uh, kind of uh, players might be an abuser candidate, something like this. And after the, the rule is designed, then they just uh, send it to the development team to add some uh, game logs to check the user behaviors. And also, the QA team, they verify whether the logs are uh, successfully stored. And after that, they will be releasing the title. Uh, and uh, uh, let me assume that the, the game logs are successfully stored to the storage. Then business intelligence team, they try to investigate, and they just analyze the gaming logs to uh, analyze the user behaviors. And they just apply some the rules to the rule-based model, and they just uh, run the rule-based model uh, in production. Then the rule-based model will be detecting some abuser candidate, and that the the rule-based model will be notifying to the ops team to investigate uh, this abuser candidate is abusers or not. 
So Ops team and development studio, they uh, collaborate to investigate uh, those kind of user activities. And also, uh, if uh, that abuser candidate is truly abusers, then they just block the users. And if not, it, uh, if that is a false alarm, then uh, the intelligence team, they change the code and uh, they modify the rules to detect the right uh, abusers. But as you can see, so many teams are engaged and so many processes, and it takes a long time to uh, modify and change the rule-based model. So as you as you've seen, uh, there are some problems to run the rule-based model. The first one is that, honestly, it has the small coverages to detectable users because uh, it's actually working on rule-based model. So if the, someone is abusing without rules or without yeah, some unpredicted the behaviors, then rule-based model doesn't expect this is an abuser or not. And as you see, that it's really hard to keep up with the speed of the content update and new patterns because uh, mostly the, in order to retain the heavy spenders, uh, the most important thing is that the development studio uh, keep continuously updates the content to spend money. So mostly uh, they are focusing to develop the game features yeah, and they usually deprioritize to adding a new rules, uh, new, yeah, the rule base, they uh, adding the new rule base model. So it's really hard to keep, maintain the rule base model. Yeah, due to that issues, Net Marbles are trying to decide uh, to leverage the ML technologies yeah, in order to learn from the user behaviors instead of adding something by hand. So in this section, uh, SG Sensei will be presenting about the challenges of uh, what uh, SG and uh, NetMarble has been faced to leverage ML models. And also, uh, he's going to give you uh, pr the, the solutions what NetMarble is currently using. So please welcome SG on the stage. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jason, and good to see you, everyone. Uh, I'm Itsuji Nakai. I'm a solutions architect for Google Cloud Platform. I'm based in Tokyo, Japan. And as you know, the customer, Netmarble, is a company based in Korea. So I traveled quite a lot of times last year to Korea to meet the customer and help them develop the machine learning model to solve the problem that Jason had just explained. And I conducted machine learning workshops for them several times, actually quite a lot of times. And <laughs> of course, I'm not complaining about it. It was rather exciting, very pleasure, uh, pro, uh, pleasure experience for me. Uh, because some of you may know that having a conversation about machine learning with a customer is always challenging because it requires a variety of knowledge for both of us. First, we must understand what is machine learning. We must know uh, the nature of the data set, and we must know the business goals. In other words, we must have the domain knowledge. In this case, it is a knowledge in the gaming industry. And in that sense, the collaboration with Netmarble the data scientist team in Netmarble was a perfect example for me. Because in Netmarble, they have the very strong data scientist AI team focusing on AI technology. They have very good understanding about machine learning, and they know the nature of their data set, and they are naturally the experts of the gaming industry. So what about the Google side? First. I'm a machine learning expert. I have very deep knowledge about machine learning, I can say that. However, I don't have much knowledge in the gaming industry. I don't play mobile games very much. I'm sorry, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> However, on the Google side, we have the customer engineer, Jason. Uh, he has a very deep knowledge and experience in the gaming industry. So by sharing our experience and knowledge, we collaborated very successfully together to achieve the business result. 
And for now, I will explain some technical details of the machine learning model they used. They developed together with us to detect abnormal users or abnormal data. And, wait, okay. This is a very short answer. They used the machine learning model called OAT encoder to detect abnormal data. This is a very simplified diagram of the OAT encoder, but actually the mechanism of OAT encoder is very simple. Uh, it is a machine learning model to regenerate the same data as input on the output side. So we train this machine learning model to minimize the delta between input and output. And the question is, how and why we can use this machine learning model to detect abnormal data. To explain that, I prepared a simple tiny toy model using the MNIST dataset. MNIST dataset is, as you know, the collection of handwritten digital images. We very often use this dataset to explain some basic mechanism of machine learning. So this is a kind of hello world example. But anyway, uh, I will show you some code. Okay, can you turn to the demonstration? Okay, uh, this is a collab notebook. I implement the tiny toy model uh, on this notebook. So let me go through this notebook. First, I import some modules and I download the MNIST dataset and I define the machine learning model, old encoder. I don't explain details of the code, but if you know about Keras, you can understand what's happening. I define the very simple neural network model with six layers. And I will train this machine learning model to minimize the delta between input and output by using the MSE, uh, mean squares error, to, uh, as a loss function. And I will train this machine learning model initially with just a little data, only for a single epoch. And this is a result. The top side is the input data, and the bottom side is the output data. You can see that this model is now trying very hard, like a small child, to regenerate the same data, but it's not perfect. So I will keep training. I train this model with some additional data for more epochs, and you will see the result. like this one, okay, it's far better now. And now I will use this trend model to detect some, abnorm uh, some abnormal data. Okay, I draw some number on this white canvas. And first I try some simple one, just number zero. And you see the result, the output is very similar to the input. And now I try something different. I draw not a number, but a letter B. Can you guess what would happen? <laughs> yes. The output is different from letter B. It looks like number eight or number three. Yeah, this is because I train this machine learning model with only numbers. So it always try to regenerate some data similar to numbers. So in this case, the output is totally different from the input. So by comparing the input and the output, you can say that if the delta is very large, this input is different from training data. This is something different from numbers. This is a basic mechanism. Can you go back to the presentation? Okay. So once you train this machine learning model with normal data, you can use this machine learning model to detect abnormal data by comparing the input and output. Very good. However, now you are faced with a technical challenge number one, no label data. As I told you, you need to train this machine learning model 
with only normal data. To do that, you have to split your whole data set into two parts, normal part and abnormal part. How can we do that? We need a machine learning model for that. So this is a chicken and egg problem. I think this is a very common problem in the gaming industry. Generally, they have a lot of, lot of data, but they are not well organized. They need some tricks to organize those data so that they can use that data for machine learning. However, sometimes you need machine learning itself to do that. So we had several discussions how we can solve this problem. And our solution is surprisingly simple. We use the whole data, including abnormal ones, to train this machine learning model. And naturally, we have several assumptions behind that. One of the biggest assumptions is that the amount of abnormal data is very, very small compared to the normal data. So the inference of abnormal data will be simply overwritten by the huge amount of normal data. Of course, this is just an assumption. We have to verify that. We tried several different machine learning models to check our assumption. And finally, it actually worked. Sounds good? I guess some of you are now thinking this is too simple. This is different from what I expected to hear. <laughs> yeah, however, in reality, the most important part of applying machine learning to your business is to choose the best and the simplest machine learning model to solve your problem. It is a very tricky part. To do that, you have to understand variety of machine learning models, pros and cons of them, and you need to choose the best and simplest one. It's very hard. And that's why I'm here. <laughs> I can help you for that. I actually have NetMarble for that. Anyway, uh, before going to explain uh, another technical challenge, I want to explain the production use case of this machine learning model. Now they retrain this ma uh, machine learning model every day using the fresh data in past two days. And after retraining the machine learning model, they deploy the trained model to the production system. And then they use the same real time gaming long data to detect abnormal users. And then they create a list of suspicious users and send the list to the operational team. And finally, the operational team do manual further investigation to have a concrete evidence that some users did actually something wrong. And then they decide the appropriate action against those bad users. And again, you may have some questions. First question is why we have to retrain the model every day? Because the data freshness matters. In the world of online gaming, especially in MMORPG, the user behavior always changes. Due to some reasons, sometimes they have some in-gaming events, they release new game features and characters every day, and even without those uh, uh, elements, maturity of users naturally influence the behavior of those users. So it's a kind of natural evolution in the uh, virtual gaming world. So to keep up with these changing realities, we have to retrain the model every day with the fresh data. And the second question is, why manual investigation? Isn't it machine learning to automate everything? Isn't it a good idea to automatically block bad users? Unfortunately, it's not a good idea uh, from several reasons. One of those reasons is to avoid false positives. It's really bad if we block some normal users mistakenly. It's the last thing we want to do. And the second reason is to decide the appropriate action against bad users is sometimes very tricky. 
Suppose that we found several users who did something wrong just one time from curiosity, and what if they are very loyal users, they spent a lot of time for that game, they spent a lot of money. In that case, simply blocking those users is not a right business delay, uh, decision. So they have to understand the real nature of those bad behaviors. They have to understand the real nature of those users to decide the appropriate action against them. That's why they need a manual investigation. And the last reason is somewhat interesting. Uh, by doing manual investigation, they can understand some new patterns of abnormal behaviors and apply those knowledge to the existing rule-based model to improve them. You may have thought that once we create the machine learning model, we can throw away all the existing old rule-based models. It is not the case. In some cases, rule-based model works better than machine learning. It is a reality. So combining machine learning and rule-based model is the ideal solution. And in this particular case, they can get new insights about the new patterns of abnormal behaviors because machine learning is very good at finding new patterns automatically. And then they can use that new finding to improve the existing rule-based system. So this is a very good virtual cycle. Okay, now we are faced with the technical challenge number two. It is model explainability, what it means. Because the operational team needs to do some manual investigation, they need some hint. Why this machine learning model detected these users as abnormal? Without any reason, they can't do the manual investigation effectively. They need some hint from the machine learning model. This is the problem, what we generally call model explainability. And to solve this problem, the AI team in NetMarble apply the feature engineering. It means instead of using the original raw data to train the machine learning model, they combined those raw data, raw features, to create some new features. Those are interpretable and explainable. And then they use those uh, engineered features to train the machine learning model. And after the training, they can compare the delta between input and output for each feature. If some specific feature has a large delta, it is exactly the reason why this machine learning model detected this user as abnormal. And this feature is interpretable. Operational team can use this information to do further manual investigation effectively. And this is the overview of the feature engineering the AI team in NetMarble applied. The original data is naturally a time series data because this is a gaming log data. And they aggregated this time series data with 60 minutes time window uh, to create new interpretable features. And you can see some functions or formulas they used to aggregate to create interpretable features. Unfortunately, details of these features or formulas are confidential. These are very, very important intellectual property of NetMarble. They cannot disclose everything. But if you have some knowledge in data science or at least statistics, uh, you can guess what they are doing to create some interpretable features, okay? And this is the last slide for me. Instead of using the standard normal autoencoder model, they decided to use stacked denoising autoencoder to detect abnormal users. I don't have much time to explain what is denoising autoencoder. <laughs> Uh, but I will give some keywords. The most important keyword is uh, spillover effect. By using the denoising feature, you can avoid the spillover effect of standard autoencoder. And by avoiding the spillover effect, 
you can improve the explainability of the model. If you are really interested in that, you can uh, search some academic papers with the keyword denoising old encoder and the spillover effect. Uh, basically, by avoiding a spillover effect, you can specifically identify the feature which affects the, uh, the delta between input and output. Uh, please search some academic papers for details. Okay, anyway, uh, now Jennifer from NetMarble will talk about some technical details of, the, of their machine learning pipeline and how we have collaborated together to achieve the actual business result. Please welcome Jennifer to the stage. Thank you for having me at GG. Hello everyone, my name is Jennifer Oh. I am ML engineer in NetMarble, and I was also a key member of Anomaly Detection Project. <laughs> I'm here to share two kinds of challenges we had and how we solved them. Oh, before we start, there's a little dinosaur on the right, <laughs> right top of the screen. You might wanna check how the emotion changes by each slide. Anyway, so, <laughs> so the first challenge was this. We had so many game titles. And these game titles have unique user behaviors. As you can see on the screen, there are some MMORPG games, adventure RPG games, and also others. And, and these games have a very different data schema and data distribution since all the games were made by our subsidiary companies. So therefore, we could not train all the data into one model. That means we needed at least one model product per game. That's a huge amount of model products. So we, said, we thought that we needed a standardized platform that could handle multiple model products. So the solution for this was simply GCP. Using GCP, we could standardize this whole, whole uh, system. And let's, set, let's check that out then in detail. So using GCP, we did not have to uh, manage the machines and services since they are all managed. And we did not have to make new APIs, functions, since all of, most of them are already made. So even if we had like, new game titles, which requires new functions, we did not have to make them. Also, it was easy to scale the system scale, change the system scale, which is very important. Whether you want to use distributed environment or not, or no matter how large scale you want to use, we did not have to change anything except a line in your config file or the CLI command. Let's say suddenly a game DAU has doubled in a day, which might happen in a few games. And so the data size would be doubled too. In that case, normally we have to like add some new machines, do some setups and tests. But in our case, we don't have any worries. Like, oh, what's the big deal about it? We just, all we have to do was to just change the number of nodes from 10 to 20. So with these reasons, we were able to standardize this whole system. So let's check out our system architecture. As you can see on the screen, all the game data was saved on BigQuery. So we use Dataflow to extract data from BigQuery and do pre-processing. And all the pre-processed data would be saved on GCS. Using the CSV files, we run ML uh, training job on ML engine. When the training job is done, the exported model will be saved on GCS. So using the GC, uh, file saved on GCS, we can register the model on ML engine so that we can use as prediction. Let's move on to the prediction process. So starting from the pre-processed files, which is same as the training part, we run a prediction job on ML engine. And when the prediction job is done, 
the predicted results will be saved on GCS. And we can just upload the CSV files to BigQuery and then send the predicted results to our customers, which are game operational team. So uh, all this process is also scheduled by Jenkins. The process is uh, run every day or maybe even every hour. So guess ma how many people we need to manage this whole system? Just one or maybe even less. So if we want to apply uh, anomaly detection to a new game, all we have to do is to do data EDA and some feature selection, since all the game data are, are all different. And we might do some prepar uh, preparation for the data pre-processing and change some model parameters, and it's ready for the production. So that's it for the first challenge we had, and let's go move on to the next challenge. So this is our next challenge we had. So we wanted good model performance. So in order to do that, we had to read more papers and blogs and run some tests with uh, multiple models. However, we were running out of time and we did not have enough uh, human resources. So we chose to collaborate with Google. Let's check them, check them in detail. So the first thing we did was having a workshop with HG Sensei. <laughs> so we explained our situation and our problem, and he shared his thoughts and ideas. So we did architecture brainstorming together and model algorithm brainstorming together. And after a few days, uh, he gave us a fantastic idea about anomaly detection, which our current system is mostly based on. Thank you, HG. <laughs> And so we had the idea, and the next thing we had to do was uh, run some tests with uh, multiple model algorithms and find which one is the best for our system. So the next thing we chose to do was to do a Google PSO project. Then Marble and the PSO team ran MVM about different model algorithms in parallel such as statistical model, LSTM deep autoencoder, and stacked denoising autoencoder. With the results from each team, we were able to choose which the best model that fits our system. There were also many supports from the Google technical account managers and customer engineers like Jason, and also we had Bespin Global, who's our GCP partners. They were there to help us when there's any problem with GCP, and also they shared us some updates so that we can prepare for the updates. And also they provided many supports so we could have a like, smooth up co collaboration with Google. As a result, we finished our project successfully and efficiently. What I mean by efficiently is that we only used few human resources and also few time. Let's check the model uh, results as a developer's perspective and also user's perspective. This is a graph showing number of users daily. As you can see on the graph, there's a light blue graph, which is showing the number of suspicious users detected by the model. The dark blue ones are the ones who are blocked by, by the operational team. So as you can see, most of the users detected were invested, investigated by the operational team, and they were turned out to be abusers using hack tools so they were blocked from playing the game again. Okay, this is a graph showing number of abuser reporting posts on public web page. So when normal users see abusers when they are playing game, they put up some posts saying to complain about the abusers or to request us to block them. They'll get angry if they see the abusers winning so easily. So 
the number of your user reports were used to be that high, but once the anomaly detection was released, the number, the graph dropped down steeply. This happened because the coverage of the ML model was much larger than the original rule-based model that Jason has explained. So that's it for the challenges we had, and let's move on to the next part. So from now on, let's find out, let's find out about things we are going to do in the future. Until now in NetMobile, we were running many AI projects besides from the anomaly detection. There's ad fraud detection, which is detecting some fraud information sent by the ad company. There's rust uh, prediction, which is predicting uh, return on ad spent. There's gold farming detection, which is detecting users who run thousands of bots to collect uh, real game resources. There's test automation, which is uh, using an AI model to run a game function test. There's auto balance evaluation, which is also using AI model to test the game balance automatically. And also, last but not least, the voice command, which is uh, playing game automatically using the user's voice. Well, in the future, we are planning to do more and more AI projects. We are going to extend the AI to all of our businesses. And we are going to enhance partnership with Google, of course. And we are going to do more collaboration and cooperation with industry university and also Japan and North America AI companies. So that's it for the NetMobile side, and let's hear more about the technical side by Jason. Uh, thank you, Jennifer, for the, yeah, the best messages for us. So uh, we are still uh, very closely working with uh, NetMarble in order to enhance their ML models and ML pipelines. So we are trying to uh, do some uh, technical challenges still. Yeah, technical challenges. So the first thing is that uh, we are collecting label data. As SCG mentioned, it's really hard to collect label data in reality because no one, no abusers, they don't want to yeah, get sight. Yeah, they just want to hide. So uh, in order to leverage the current models, the detecting power is increased up to 10, pl 10 plus times. So we are collecting more blocked users. And we are just thinking, what if we can leverage those kind of blocked users as a labels? So if we can leverage those kind of blocked users and their features and user behaviors, then we can develop the the supervised learning models. So autoencoder is based on the unsupervised learning by clustering some player behaviors. So we are also trying to leverage the supervised model by leveraging blocked user information. And second, the challenge is that we are still revamping ML pipelines. So as, as Jennifer mentioned, all the ML pipeline is based on our the managed solutions, but then Marble chairman, uh, is very satisfied the performance of current models, so he is encouraging to deploy their ML model to new releasing gaming titles. It means that they have to manage more than 10 plus the ML models in this year. In order to support this, uh, we are trying to migrate their ML pipeline to Kubeflow pipeline to accelerate the model development. And the last part is that we are trying to do ensemble running. So as SG mentioned, we are not uh, only using single model, but also we are leveraging rule-based model, and we are trying to use the supervised learning model and the other models uh, to, to empower the detection. Yeah, so we are use, uh, trying to use ensemble learning. So hopefully, uh, in next, next year, yeah, I'm going to give you more detail about our challenges. 
So that's it. Uh, thanks for having this session. And uh, I want to give you one more thing is that your feedback is highly appreciated. So uh, before you leave the stage, uh, please uh, complete the survey on the cloud, on, uh, the cloud next app. Thank you, everyone. 감사합니다. Thank you.